Welcome to the Massage Hodge podcast. My name is Nick Paterka, a licensed massage therapist in Portland, Oregon. I am joined today by Sharon Bryant, a fellow licensed massage therapist from the state of Alabama. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much for having me. You are so welcome. And your private practice there in Alabama is called Harvest Moon Massage Therapy and Reflexology. Yes. That's a yes. lot of letters awesome. for you to type out. It is a lot of letters, but you know, um, when, when I first started my business, there were very few reflexologists in the state of Alabama. Yeah. Um, and I was hoping to kind of, you know, get the SEO going. <laughs> yeah, uh, fair enough. Smart. Business <laughs> so, move. I like yeah. that. And you're also an educator with the Alabama Barefoot Massage Training Center. Yes, I That's teach correct. barefoot massage. Um, to other massage therapists. To other massage therapists. Yes, absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, give me a little origin story as to how you got to massage therapy in the first place, and then maybe how from there how you became interested in barefoot massage as well. Okay. So um, I spent about 25 years in the defense industry as a – my degree was in mathematics. Wow, cool. And um, spent a lot of time – my friends joke that I spent a lot of time doing rocket science, and I guess that's – somewhat accurate, but I was, I never really considered myself a rocket scientist, um, but I did a lot of engineering work um, and did a lot of support with different um, military systems and things that flew in the air and bombs and things of that nature. But um, yeah, so I spent 25 years there and it was an extremely, extremely stressful um, business to be in. Um, especially as a female in STEM, essentially STEM programs. Mm. So um, I don't know. I'd had a massage when I was like in my mid twenties. Someone gave me a gift certificate or something, and I went and had a massage. And um, it was interesting. She was a little scary because she, she I didn't know at that point in time that you could kind of read people by um, their that their body could tell you what was going on in their life you know she could tell me that I had a lot of stress surrounding this or that or the other because of the way my shoulders felt or mm -hmm. you know whatever and she started you know kind of speaking all of this um witchcraft stuff to me and I'm like how did you know that <laughs> so and now I know she's just body reading right you know my body's telling her where my stress is and then how where I hold things um but, but that was in my 20s. And then in my 30s, I had this um, uh, health scare and um, went to my doctor and had a lump on the back of my neck. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know what it was. And um, she went through, she didn't do any biopsying, but she went through this, uh, you know, I guess her books testing and everything. And she came back and finally said, you know, I don't really think this is anything. I think it's muscular. And so she sent me to her massage therapist. And uh, it, it was like, wow a doctor sent me to a massage therapist and I went to her three times and it was like, she fixed my neck. The lump went away. I felt better. I kept going. And, um, and I used this same massage therapist for a lot of years because at that point in time, I had been sitting at a desk since I was in kindergarten. You know, I went to school, I sat at a desk and then I went into my professional life and I sat at a desk and I had been at a desk at a computer for, you know, however many years that was in my back and was having the headaches and, mm -hmm. you know, all of your typical desk jockey issues. Yep. And uh, yeah, she, I just kind of stuck with her and was a regular massage consumer and, you know, she could tell that my stress was growing and I started talking to her about, you know, maybe getting out because she was one of the ones that had gotten out of her, first career and gone into massage therapy and um, a new program was opening at our local community college and she knew the lady that was putting it together and connected us and I went to massage school cool. while I was working full-time as an engineer <laughs> and um, came out of school and started my practice per, private practice right away and um, yeah just it kind of went from there. It was, it was slow going in the beginning, but um, it was good stress relief. And then, you know, it, it's sort of like one, one arc was rising and one arc was reducing. Mm. And I eventually um, became a full-time massage therapist when um, the contract that I'd been working on for about 11 years um, got rebid and went to a different company. And I was not willing to jump all, through all those hoops because I knew I was transitioning into full-time massage therapy. I couldn't handle the stress anymore. Yeah. So. And when did, when did barefoot come into it? 
So um, Barefoot came in really, really early, actually. Um, we had an instructor um, come in with us in the last semester that I was in school. It was a three semester program that took an entire year. Um, and the third semester, we had a new instructor come in and she was actually an Ashiatsu uh, barefoot therapist. Mm -hmm. And um, none of us, they, our school did not do a good job of surveying different modalities. Mm -hmm. um, we learned um, deep tissue and Swedish essentially. And yeah. so she comes in third semester and she's like, what do you mean you've never heard of this and you've never heard of that? And so she started um, kind of doing that part of the, you know, there's a lot of different stuff in massage therapy and, and you need to be exposed to it. And she was, she was an Ashiatsu therapist. So we had a field trip to her home and she put one of the girls on the table and jumped up on the table with her bars and started massaging with her feet. And I'm five foot two. Um, most people don't know that, but I'm, I'm five foot two. And I had already realized that this was going to be hard on my body. Yeah. And so as an in engineering type, you know, as someone who's super logical and kind of a thinks in a straight line, I'm watching her do this and I'm thinking, you know what, <laughs> I could do this. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was sort of a light bulb moment even before I was licensed that I kind of knew I wanted to check into it. So, you know, went home that night and I got on the internet and started searching and um, graduated in May of 2008. And the next February, I had located a class that I wanted to take and started training. And by, by the end of 2009, I was fully certified as a barefoot massage therapist. Cool. So, and then, yeah, um, yeah. And then it's just sort of progressed. I still have not experienced that for myself, and I and I know some good <laughs> practitioners here. And I I really when when my when my world reopens over here, I think I'm going to go get one of those. Just cause yeah, you, you should try it. That. Yeah, yeah, just to know, just to find out and see what it's like. And I work with a lot of massage therapists. It's great. I love it. Um, it it's now, a, is, for is me practicing ashiatsu just for the the five foot two crowd, or could a six one guy get up on the bars? Oh yeah, a six. That you might know what we, people. They'd look at me and go like, "Wait, what are you going to do?" <laughs> so we, you know, we've trained. I've trained a couple of guys. Um, none of them were six foot one, but um, I have had a couple of women in some classes that I've taken that were six foot. Yeah. So I mean, you know, you you just you have to pick your. Um, your audience, you know, your, your ideal clientele, right. you know, uh, um, one of the guys that we've, we've trained through center for barefoot massage, he does a lot of sports style, mm -hmm. you know, so he's doing a lot of stretching and he's in the gyms and at sporting events and it works for him because, you know, it's not like a spa setting where you walk in and, you know, <laughs> right. you know, I, I'm here to be your therapist and I'm, you know, six foot one and, you know, however much I weigh and the rig sort of looks a little scary because everything has to be so tall in order yeah. to accommodate it. So, yeah. 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 Well, let's jump over to Alabama. What does it take okay. to be, to get a license in the state of Alabama and to maintain it? Okay. So in Alabama, we have, a, you know, the initial training requirement is 650 hours. Okay. Um, so, so you have to go to a state approved school. They don't have to be um, accredited, but they do have to be approved to the state. So you have to go to a state approved school and then you have to um, pass what's now the MBLEX. Okay. Um, I, I took the NCBTM right. that test because it was so long ago, but now it's just a nationally recognized test. They'll take right. anything that's nationally recognized. And so it's the MBLEX. And once passing the MBLEX, you have to apply for a license and go through the application process and yeah. pay your fee and, you know, if, if everything is approved, then you get your license. Okay. And then as far as CE to, to maintain it? Yeah, CE is uh, 16 hours every two years. So we renew our licenses every two years. Okay. So it's 16 hours. Um, and we don't have any, um, well, there are some restrictions on what you can take. Um, you know, like ethics, you can only claim two hours out of every 16. Mm. Um and you're not required. Are, are those two? We're not required, required ethics. To be ethics. Oh no, we're not required any ethics as continuing education. Um, and if you take ethics, you can only claim two of the ethics hours as continuing education. Um, but it can all be online. You don't okay. have to take. There's no. There's no mandatory in-person continuing education required yeah. in the state of Alabama. And um, you know, 
unfortunately, we have a lot of people who have never taken in-person um, classes after uh, they leave school. And it's, it's yeah. really sad to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that seems pretty straightforward. So uh, here we are in June of 2020. Can you believe <laughs> It's wow. <laughs> uh, we're we're still all reeling in the the coronavirus crisis. So yeah, you could give me the lay of the land. How did things unfold there, and and where are you at now? Um. Well, so I, I wrote a timeline down because it happened very strangely here in Alabama. You know, we started seeing on the news what was going on on the West Coast in Washington. Um, and then on the 16th of March here, Jefferson County, which is the county that holds Birmingham, Alabama, it's our, you know, the middle of the state, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, there's an international airport there. Jefferson County had a pretty um, alarming outbreak of positive mm -hmm. tests, and they, on the 16th, they actually um, shut down. But it was just that pocket, that one little okay. county in Alabama. And then things seemed to kind of emanate from there. Um, that was on the 16th. And I, that was the last day that I actually worked because I kept watching what was happening. And it was, you know, not knowing, not having information about how this virus was reacting and, and the, the outbreaks happening. Um, I went ahead and shut my practice down on the 16th. And on the 20th, the governor shut our state down. Okay. So in, in a week's time, we went from one pocket to the whole state needs to shut yeah. down. And it was, uh, it wasn't really, um, they called it safe at home. So, it, and right. it wasn't mandatory, but they, they, um, recommended that you only leave your home to go to work if you were essential, um, or groceries or medical care. I see. So, and that was on the 16th of March. Um, the 20th of March, we went statewide and they, said April 24th, they were going to reevaluate and they did. They started opening, I think, essential services like, um, like you could do non-essential medical things. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I'm losing the word, but anyway, the, certain things opened back up. Massage therapy didn't, when they made that announcement for the 24th of April, they said that massage was going to be lumped in with hairdressers and tattoo parlors and things okay. of that nature. Personal services. Uh, personal service. Close. They called it close contact services. That's okay. what they called it here. Um, and so they were going to go, they pushed that out to um, May 18th. Okay. So I started planning and, and watching and, you know, kind of, okay, what's going to happen in this first wave and watching the numbers and planning, okay, maybe on May 18th, I'll come back kind of thing. Um, and then, then the, a week went by and they jumped the gun and said, oh, on May 11th, everything can open back up as far as, you know, the close contact services mm. and barbering and, and hair and tattooing. And there were several other things lumped in that whole big thing. But, but we went, you know, they put us very directly in with, with the close contact services. Yeah. And I didn't go back. I, I was like, I'm not prepared. I don't have all the equipment that I need. Okay. Still trying to figure out what's going to be safe and what's not going to be safe. Yeah. Um, so I did start, I did like some family members mm -hmm. on the 18th, um, which was the original date. They told us we could go back. Um, and since then, I, I very reduced schedule. I'm not taking very many people. I'm mm -hmm. leaving a lot of time in between clients so that, yeah. Um, I can get all the cleaning done, get the air quality in the room as good as I can get it, you know, before, you know, so just try really trying to minimize how much virus potentially could be in the room so that I can protect myself and protect my clients and everyone else coming in behind them. Yeah. And I'm in a multi-therapist um, building. Oh, okay. So, you know, it's not just me, it's them and all of their clients and yeah. Yeah, it's it and it's it's been very stressful. Um, I was a person that before, you know, before the shutdown happened, I would have told you that I'd had very little anxiety. I had a lot of stress, but I'd had very little anxiety in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, it, that in itself has been very eye opening mental health wise for me at how um, out of control my anxiety got in the beginning of all of this. Um, yeah. And, and even now going back to work and, you know, having to wear the mask and. And, and all of the PPE and, 
you know, just trying to make sure everybody's safe and that the people coming in the door have filled out the correct forms. And yeah, I, I think a honest. lot of that is the reason that we've lost so many uh, people from the field during this. People have just Absolutely. decided to just, they just couldn't handle the anxiety and the, yeah. the uncertainty of, of what they might be exposing clients to and just, just didn't feel safe and felt too anxious. So they just said, I'm going to yeah. go do something else. And yeah. And you know, I'm, this is second career for me. So it really is not an option. I mean, the, that option, if I was at retirement age, maybe I would have considered that, but, but yeah, no, um, this is, you don't want to go back and do math for uh, launching rockets or? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I, you know, I miss, here's what I miss. I, I miss the data analysis part of it. Yeah. Um, it's been a real struggle with all these numbers that we see being thrown around every night on the nightly news and all these dashboards with all the numbers. It's like, oh, I'd love to dig into some of this data and really see what we can push out of it and what we can learn from it. Yeah, that part I that part I miss, but the part about you know commuting and having to deal with other people, <laughs> and and just that whole being employed is very. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'm done with that part yeah, of my life. A boss and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so I like the self employment. You, what did you? Well, I actually know the answer to this because I found an epic blog post that you did about all the things you've been up to during the during. Oh. The- it's a long oh. list. Uh, I, some, some seem more productive than others, but I, you know, <laughs> I make no judgments. But maybe just on a on a bigger perspective, like what what are the kind of things you've been working on and and trying to take your mind off of that anxiety? Yeah, so um, I'm a lifelong learner. Mm-hmm. I love learning things. Um, I like doing hobbies. So um, I have haven't I did a lot of crocheting. I will tell you early on, I did a lot of crocheting because it's one of those things that. You can uh, keep your hands keep, busy and keep your hands busy and let your mind go. Yeah. So or you, um, can, you can uh, you can binge watch a show while you crochet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm one of those people. I can't just sit and watch television, you know, so got to be doing something else while the TV's on. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So there was that. Um, I sewed masks for quite a while because that That's was good. kind of a talent that I have that um, I could leverage into something useful. Mm-hmm. And for me, being useful is really important. I've done quite a bit of education. Um, I did a role model method class, um, correspondence course kind of thing, mm. um, which is, you know, self massage rolling with the balls and stuff. Oh. So that's kind of cool. And I, I think, um, I hope in the future to be able to leverage that into something that if we go through this whole shutdown business again, which wouldn't surprise me, um, maybe I can leverage it into something where I can help my clients and actually give them some relief virtually. You know, they're, yeah, they're, they're yeah, I'm, getting at, I'm looking at similar things uh, yeah, yeah. As that go, yeah, as well. Yeah, I, I recently did the John Hops, John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins Coursera course for the contact tracing. Have you seen that? Uh, it's not. a free course. Okay. Well, it's a free course. And I did it not because I want to become a contact tracer. I think I would be horrible at that, actually. But there was so much education in it about the virus, about how the virus functions. Uh-huh. Um, about um, when that virus is um, infected, you know, when you can infect other people, even though you're not having and timelines. And it it just, it's a lot of understanding that I'm finding very useful talking to clients now and evaluating whether it's safe to work on someone or not. Yeah. So um, when you went through that, uh, as, as it goes to contact tracing, like, did you come away thinking like some of the, the talk I've heard around that made me feel like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to reopen my doors and then mm-hmm. a week later, a contact tracer is going to call me and tell me that one of my clients was exposed. So then I'm instructed to close for two weeks. And, um, then, and then I'm going to close for two weeks. And then I'm going to work for a day. And then <laughs> you're going to close for two more weeks. And tell me that I need to close. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. That kind of like, that's what I get. I have a little anxiety about that situation. Right. Um, so. I think the only way that you would get a phone call from a contact tracer is if you had seen that person within the two days before they became symptomatic. Okay. That's when they can shed virus and actually give it to you. Or they were already actively sick and they lied to you and came and gotten on your table. I see. Has already happened. I mean, I've read of a couple different cases of that already happening. 
where where clients knowing that they're they shouldn't be getting but they correct sort of like they're, yeah they're yeah. getting a massage even though they already know that they've been exposed and are likely infected oh interesting yeah so um yeah I, I don't know i think there's so much local policy involved with contact tracing you know it, it's going to be run through people's state departments of health and different policies and yeah. there is a lot there is a lot of um angst and fear surrounding contact tracing, but you know, they've used it for over a hundred years. The Spanish flu, they did contact tracing, the Ebola outbreaks in, in Africa, the, how they finally mostly brought those under control. The large outbreaks was with contact tracing and helping mm -hmm. people um, isolate themselves until, you know, they could get it under control. Yeah. So, so how do you see this crisis affecting massage therapy on a more global perspective? What what changes do you see good or bad or or what what would you like to see? Um yeah, I I really think it's going to condense our industry and and by that I mean the people that are really supposed to be doing this work mm -hmm. are the ones that are going to be doing this work. Yeah. And the ones that um, have so much anxiety and fear that they can't do the work are going to get out like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, and it's unfortunate um, because I don't know, before all this happened, I was at full speed. I was at maximum capacity. I was physically burning out mm -hmm. and really needed a break and was glad to see students coming in to be trained and, and, um, go on, go out and take a little bit of the, the load. Yeah. And now, you know, now we're losing therapists everywhere, I think, yeah. because I was, I was listening to a podcast yesterday and it was a hairdresser, not a, not a massage therapist, but it was a hairdresser who was terrified to go back to work. And, um, I felt really bad for her because yeah. she was being forced to go back to work and she was thinking about quitting. And I was, mm. and you know, I think it's the same thing with us. People are, you know, being told there's no more unemployment. You need to go back to work or you're going to yeah. be living on savings or moving back in with your family. And I think it's really sad, but I really think that's where it's going to go. People are going to get out. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't thought too much about what, it, cause I, I own a private practice too, which right. I, only, I actually only started in January, you know, right before this kind of happened. So that's, that's been a, an interesting ride as well, but to be an employee at this time and to have your employer say like, we're, we're opening and you have to come work or quit, I guess would be really challenging. Yeah. I'm, re I'm really curious to see what the franchises are going to do. Yeah. I'm, I read something the other day. I was listening to your podcast mm -hmm. and you were talking to someone about the franchises. I forget who it was, but um, I had read something that the franchise, one of the franchises and they didn't name names had put out a video on how they were going to be cleaning, you okay. know, in between clients and they had increased their cleaning routine from two minutes to a whopping three and a half minutes. <sighs> And I was like, you know, first of all, I've never worked for anyone as a massage therapist. I've never been employed. I worked for both of the big franchises. Right. I heard you say that. So I, I was just stunned, number one, that, you know, they were only allotting two minutes for a room flip and the room to be cleaned. Right. And then when they thought that they could like go in and have enough time. <laughs> to, you know, clean and sanitize a room in three and a half minutes. I can't do that. And I'm private practice. And I, you know, I bought all my own cleaners. I developed all my own processes. I know exactly what to do when now, but I can't do it in three and a half minutes. No um, way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> well, like my, when I open, I mean, I've, I've always been at 30 minutes in between. I like the breathing room. I'm going to right. an hour. Yeah. I went to 45 minutes. Yeah. Because my clients like to show up early. So it's like, oh. <laughs> you got to train your clients to come at the right time. Well, you know, um, state of Alabama has, uh, we still have our, the ADPH, Alabama Department of Public Health. Um, we still cannot have clients in our lobby. Ah. You know, they're having to wait in their car. So that is kind of um, 
dissuading them from coming so early because, you know, they, I know they would come sit in the lobby and they knew if I saw them, if I was ready, I would go ahead and take them. Yeah. Even if it was, you know, 15 minutes early. So my, you know, that's me not setting a boundary and, and, and holding it. But my philosophy was always, if I start 15 minutes early, I get finished 15 minutes early. And especially if it's the last one, I get to go home early. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I guess we'll have to keep an eye on some of these changes coming. I don't know about that three and a half minutes. My experience would tell me that that's not going to have any meaningful impact on real world experience. Like, no, it doesn't. And, you know, and here's my here's my fear is that, you know, they're going to become a center, a disease vector. You know, they're going to become an epicenter in a community. Yeah. And then you're going to have that. Um that um perception that yeah. you know you got to watch out for those massage therapists because they're not cleaning up properly and, and people also, are getting I, sick i'm so curious because they're they're really vulnerable like to me i i can go out to potential clients and say i am in complete control of my environment only three to four clients come into this space every day i have a full right. hour in between whereas yeah. they have 10 therapists they have multiple people at the front desk. They have 50 people yeah. coming in throughout the day. Like as yeah. if I was just a regular client, I would look at that and go like, that doesn't seem like a good option. Right. Not a good, not a good idea. It, it's uh, okay. As someone who's super um, uh, conservative about this virus mm -hmm. and um, you know, I'm fully in the, I wear a mask. I wear a mask at work. I wear a mask when I go to the grocery store. I wear a mask when I go anywhere. There's other people that I cannot guarantee that I can be, you know, six to eight feet away from them. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing a mask. And, you know, in this area, people still laugh at you and openly ridicule you for wearing a mask. Oh, wow. Super conservative about it. I, I live, I live with people. My parents are high risk. Um, my mother-in-law is high risk. So many people in my life are high risk. I, I just can't. You know, yeah. you, I got to be conservative about it. And mm -mm, mm -mm. yeah. Oh, so many things, so many things. So um, I was doing a little research. This is serious yeah. podcast over here. There's research involved. I, uh, minutes and minutes of research. <laughs> but uh, minutes you, of research. <laughs> you had I your, Googled it. <laughs> you had your own. You had your own podcast for a time. I did. It was really short. Um, yeah. Yeah. But and anyway, but I, I just, I, I perused that a little bit and you brought up a topic on one of them that I listened to, um, a, a topic that's, that's near and dear to me, um, community versus competition. Yes. Part of yeah. my like mission statement as like to the massage hodgepodge sort of like community that I hope to create over time is valuing community over competition. It's never like, Absolutely never made any sense to me that people thought there was like a finite number of, I mean, I guess in a small town, if there was sure. like 300 people in your town and there was <laughs> six massage, then we, then there's like competition. Right. Right. Um, but in general, like, I feel like we need to raise up the level of awareness about the value of what we do so that more, there's more clients available for everyone. Absolutely. Like you said, yeah. your practice was maxed out. What did that mean? Did that mean you had like a roster of like between one and 200 people who would come to see you on a regular basis? Well, for me, it means that I can't physically take any more people in a week. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't down, know. There's only, you can only handle seeing so many other humans. Right, right. I, my body physically will only allow me to do so much massage in a week before I start breaking down. Yeah. So, in that case, I need to have a list of people that when the new client calls and says, hey, you know, I need to get in, <laughs> I can say, okay, try this one and that one and mm -hmm. try this number over yeah. here. And so many, so many therapists and they don't understand that concept that we, we don't have to be fighting each other for clients, you know, until there's one person doing a massage and one person laying on the table and there's no other people available in the world, we're not going to have competition. You know what I'm saying? Until 50% yeah. of the people are massage therapists, yeah. there's always going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So, um, yeah. And, you know, we went through a time here where we had, you know, some people coming out of school that were, um, 
their mindset was that they just needed to blow everyone else out of the water and have all of the business. <laughs> and so, yeah, that, that was a little bit of where community versus competition came from. Yeah, that's, that's so, so wild to me, especially yeah. like, because I really value the, the importance of the therapeutic relationship. And I fully oh, accept and understand that a client might just not vibe with me. Like the, right. what I do might just not work for them. Right. That's okay. Absolutely. It makes me uncomfortable to think that a client like might get a gift certificate and go try out massage somewhere, have a bad experience because that therapist wasn't right for them and then never go get work ever again because, right. but yeah. like, <laughs> There's so, yeah, I just, people should experience all different modalities from different people. And it's like, there's just, there's enough yeah. for everybody. Can yeah, you? I I totally agree. And, you know, and I even tell people when I hear stories about, oh, I went somewhere and it was an awful experience and I'm never going to have massage again. It's like, oh, you know, don't, don't say that. You know, yeah. I, I always try to educate people that I meet that are like that because, you know, go try somebody else. Everyone, everyone is different. Every massage is different. Every, the, and that therapeutic relationship, you know, you just may not, like you're talking about, you just don't click with someone sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. I mean, that's just human nature. Go find someone you click with. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. Like, it's like dating, you know, you gotta. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> <laughs> We're not allowed to say one that, but when you're young and then swear <laughs> off of it forever, you know. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe some people do it. <laughs> so, uh, so with over twelve years of experience, tell me a little bit about longevity. What do you think is important about practicing as a therapist and having a long career at it? Um, I think you have to love it. Yep. Um, I think you have to have a certain amount of compassion for people. Mm -hmm. um, not too much, but not too little. <laughs> and you have to be compassionate with yourself as well. You know, um, I, I think in our industry, we see so many people who are overly, um, th they're almost burnt out on, you know, there's so much compassion and they're taking care of other people that they, they wind up burning themselves out. Yeah. So I think it's really the self-care aspect of, and the mental aspect of self-care is really important in our industry, um, as well as taking care of our bodies. You know, um, it's, yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense to me. I like that. I, I'm trying to, I ask that question a lot because I'm going to, I'm going to eventually string all these answers together and create a little like longevity episode. So cool. I'll let yeah. you know when one happens. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious as an Ashiatsu therapist in terms of reopening, are there any special concerns as it pertains to working barefoot? I know, I know in some states, therapists are working gloved on their hands. Right. That, we, that's, that's not going to be a requirement here. I was, I'm also <laughs> imagining like I, I work, you know, it, you know, fingertip all the way to my elbows. I'm, right. Uh, right. Which I could modify if I, if I was mandated to work in gloves. I'm still kind of wrapping my head around that. But what about feet? So um, we were also not mandated to work in gloves. Mm -hmm. we had the, if we want to, we can but we were not required to unless it's intraoral work. Right. And obviously you're not going to be doing that with your feet. Right. Um, there's been, um, there's been a couple of things that I've read and listened to um, talking with epidemiologists um, about Ashiatsu specifically and what mm -hmm. they're thinking as far as that goes. Um, and because we are so far, our faces are so far away from our clients faces they're thinking that there is a less risk. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, it's all conjecture still at this point. We don't know. Um, but, but a couple of different epidemiologists have come out and, and, and theorized that, that we, as, as Ashiatsu therapists, um, using our feet and being however tall you are away from their face yeah. is going to be a better long-term. You're going to, if someone is, um, communicable, um, the viral load would be less mm. because we are at least not right in their faces. Yeah. Um, I, I do, like I said, I wear a mask. I do require that my clients wear a mask. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. yeah that makes a, go ahead. Oh no, I was just, I was just going to say, I was wondering if, 
if standard practice for barefoot massage, do you have like a station that you oh wash in? in or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's there's um there's a lot of you know you wash your feet before and after your clients just like we wash our hands. Yeah. Okay. Um. You and then you're in a shoe, some type of shoe or foot covering to get to your room. Oh, I see. Okay. And then we teach to spritz at table side. Every barefoot massage class that I've taken, um, Ashiatsu class mm-hmm. that I've taken, advocated spritzing table side with um, an alcohol based cleaner or some other anti bacterial type cleaner before you put your feet on your clients. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot of that. And there's a, a, we teach to stay on the table until you're ready to flip your client. And I do, I do spritz off again. Once clients flipped, if my feet touch the floor, I'm spritzing them before I, I touch oh. the client again. Um, because these, I think these are all things you, you, it sounds like you had dialed in and considered. Even oh yeah. 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 It's, 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 that was not a, that was not a change. You know, that was just something that we have always done. Yeah. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, last thing, just from your experience, tell me a little bit about reflexology. I don't know a ton about it. I know that some people think it's really out there and. Yeah. Woo-woo. So <clears throat> am I allowed to say who I learned with? You can say whatever you like. I okay. Say, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So I learned through the Claire Marie Miller um, method okay. of, of reflexology. And it was a, um, they teach this, a combination of the zone method and a, a, the ch- more Chinese method. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it was a good blend. It was a 16 hour weekend type course. And um, we kind of learned to map the bottom of the foot and how, so the concept is that all of the nerve endings in the body terminated the feet eventually in some form or fashion. And that by pressing these different areas of the feet that those nerves correspond to, you can affect organ systems or um, the spine or my soul or Mm -hmm. what have you. And that was sort of the concept as I learned it. Um, I will say that that program that I took was not way far out there, as you put it. There was not a lot of woo with it. Yeah. Um, I have taken a refresher with a different um, school and it was, I think, a lot more your perception. Um, okay. And and I have followed some th- uh, different things on Facebook and in different places that it was very, very much a departure and very much more into the, that realm of um, energy and mm-hmm. um, uh, myth. I, I don't sure. know how to put it. it it's yeah. like that. there's no scientific backing behind why you believe that it's going to cure your liver if I press on this spot. You know? I see. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm a very practical reflexologist. Do your feet hurt? Do you have plantar fasciitis issues? Do you have, you know, um, bunions? Do you have some other foot issue that perhaps you coming in and letting me treat you um, will help? So you, and you sort of treat it more like you're working on their feet as opposed to thinking too much about how the points you're pressing affects their, their other systems. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and typically when someone books a reflexology session, mm-hmm. we have a, a large long phone consultation about exactly what's going on. And most of the time it winds up being kind of a blended session between actual body work, um, especially the backline body work mm-hmm. and, you know, me actually doing some reflexology and working on the feet um, because I really think you have to address the back line in order to address a lot of what's happening with the feet. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And, but, and I would imagine the reflexology training just teaches you to do better work on feet, like in oh, terms yeah. of body mechanics and how to apply more pressure and what position <laughs> to put them in. And yeah, absolutely. I, I think I would be interested in taking the course for that reason. And I would listen to all the other interesting oh yeah it's interesting it's yeah. cool but you know i'm i come from an engineering yeah, background <laughs> it's like okay i don't know about that yeah. <laughs> yeah i i took a um doug nelson uh came and taught for our amta chapter last fall mm-hmm. and he did a foot and leg intensive mm-hmm that was really interesting um, combined with kind of what I already knew with reflexology and, and what he was teaching. It was, 
that was super cool. Cool. Yeah. Wow. So much. Well, thank you so much for being on the Massage Hodge podcast today. You're welcome. Really I enjoyed it. Appreciate it. <laughs> I would encourage anyone to go check out your uh, blog. You've been doing some interesting posts over there and it looked like you've been creating some educational materials. Um, yeah. You put, I, I'm sorry, I didn't write it down. That was at another site though. Uh, um, you had created a bunch of videos early on. You got really motivated. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> so along with the I just can't sit still thing, yeah. I created... I created the Idol Soul, S O L E, Idol Soul Wellness Series. Okay. Yeah, and you can find that. Yeah, get on my um, my website and get on the blog, and you can find a link to um, how to sign up for that. Yeah. And uh, or it was I kind of just went in and did anything related to anxiety, self massage, um, how to sleep a little better, you know, anything that I could think of. And I created it for my clients essentially. Oh. And also as kind of an avenue to give them something of value because I had people calling and saying, how can I help you? Can I give you money? Mm. And you know, I, I'm always a little uncomfortable when people just want to give me money. So here, <laughs> let me give you something in return. So I created yeah. this little wellness That's series good. for them. And um, yeah, um, I, I hope to do more of that. I think that was a really cool little thing and I learned a lot doing it. And yeah. um yeah, maybe I'll get better at it and do some more. <laughs> well, I will. I will link to all of that. And thanks again for being on the show. We'll chat. We can yeah. chat for a few more minutes after here. Cool. But to all the listeners out there, you can find the Massage Hodge podcast on Spotify and Apple, and you can share it with everybody you know because that would make me so very happy. Have a great day. 